Hello, my name is Paula Herlock and welcome to Dimensional Dialogues. This is our first episode and I am delighted to have as my first guest, Miss Makeda Solomon. Now, Makeda has been four years or four decades, sorry, in risk management and insurance. And when I met her, she was an actress extraordinaire in the middle of getting awards and so on. So, Makeda, welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Paula. Right. You, know, you know, when we get together, things normally just flow and happen. So, I'm, I'm happy to be your first guest. Yes. And um, I'm trusting that. Well, you guys can just imagine that this just happened like a second ago <laughs> where we decided that, hey, let's just shoot this right away. But I couldn't help but want to do this episode, Makeda, because you and I have been on this journey of spiritual evolution yes. and a commitment to wellness. Most definitely. And this is the reason why I've asked you to come on this show. Can I tell them your age? Okay, so Makeda is seven years older than me. I'm giving you a chance to digest that. She's seven years my senior. She looks like my sister to me. She looks. I'm just looking at her skin. I'm looking at everything about you, and you are in the peak of health, in my opinion. It's 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 been a journey, but it's been a positive one for the most part. And what I always say to people is that your mind, how you live mentally, has a great deal to do with how you look physically. Right. So. So one of the reasons why I asked you to be on this show is because, as you know, I've been talking about wellness a lot and the fact that a lot of the diseases and the illness and imbalances that people have today yes. have a lot to do with lifestyle. And when I met you, you had just returned to Jamaica from the UK. I didn't return. I can't. I can't. Because, yes, yes, yes. Because you were born in the UK. Yep, I'm bicultural, born and raised in England. Right. Um, and came here at the, give the, the maths now. Yes. At the tender age of 30, I always say to people, right. that's, Jamaica made a woman of me. Right. So, yes. that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. No, why I am particularly impressed with what you did mm -hmm. when I met you, you were a size. All right, is the US size or the UK size? The, the US size. US. A UK 12, mm -hmm. which would be uh, American 14. So? I think so big. But yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. You were big. <laughs> you were. And well, I drop it like it is. Yes, <laughs> you were. And I remember um, you explained to me yes. that your parents both were on dialysis. And your your sibling also was having some health challenges, and you saw what was going to go down, and you basically came to Jamaica, got connected with a very well known wellness guru, mm -hmm. and changed your life. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Your entire journey in terms of food, everything. Well, well backing up a little bit mm -hmm. because I think where my health journey started um, at, at in my teens, I lost my brother. Mm -hmm. My brother, um, he was 19 when he passed. I was just turned 18. Mm -hmm. So that was a stark kind of realization that, oh my goodness, this thing called health can just disappear from you. Just so. So um, sort of as years went by, I, I changed my diet. I, I cut out meat. It was a gradual thing, but mm -hmm. for the last probably 40 years, I've not eaten meat. And I think that is a great part of where my sort of health journey began. So, so when I came to Jamaica, um, I, I was already meatless. Mm -hmm. But what I found landing here is the fact that it was so easy to eat healthier. Now, I, they didn't have many very vegetarian options when I first came here, that was in 1995. Yes. So what would sometimes happen is you go into a restaurant and say, you know, I, I, can, do you have any dishes without the meat? And they would kind of serve up the regular thing and scrape out the meat. Right. And, 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 and some, some shredded yes. cabbage. Uh, yes, exactly. But yeah. things have come a long way since then, thankfully. Um, but the fresh produce, the fact that you can literally pick something from a tree and eat it 
um, in, in in real time. Yes. You know, we were used in the in the UK to yes. things in tin. tin when I first saw Aki on a tree growing on a tree, it was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that it grew in that way with the pod. So, so Jamaica has um, afforded me the opportunity to to do to to not only eat well but to be in an environment sunshine right sunshine to replenish right. the melanin d. and build my vitamin d levels and to um keep me my skin also moist because what i noticed whenever i went back to the uk skin dry out and it felt so different um so so back here i'm realizing that i, I realized very quickly that no man here is a much better place for my overall health so you think it's not it's the consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables versus the processed and tin and most canned definitely. products that were available to most you definitely. in england definitely. so basically you're giving credence to this whole thing of eating fresh yeah eating fruits eating yes. vegetables and eating on processed and, I, and that's what's what you're crediting to your usefulness absolutely and and frame of mind as well mm -hmm. because uh, you know you'll, you'll sort of touch on it as we go through but um i've always been called the eternal optimist mm -hmm. someone who you know is so-called glass half full glass half empty i'm always the one in the glass full to the brim mm -hmm. you know and and really gone through life with that sort of positivity and i think a positive mindset it does it keeps you joyful it keeps right. you you know sort of happy and content and that has a you know an effect on your on physiology your body, too. right i absolutely agree with that so Makeda, i know that over the years based on our relationship that you have always been an avid um, you've always maintained a regular practice tell us a little bit about your practice because i know you're committed to spiritual evolution while you're and balancing your entire um, well, I think not long after arriving in Jamaica, um, in addition to what I said earlier about it being a natural space of, you know, feeling more healthful and giving you that environment to be healthful. You know, it, it don't, I, mean, I said it to someone at the time, I said, you know, there's going to be a spiritual revolution and Jamaica is going to be at the top of it. I don't know where that come to me from, but I remember altering it to someone. And why I said that is because at the time when I came here, I was mindful of others that were coming here that saying that they just got up one day from whether it's the States or wherever else, wherever else it was overseas, and they just had to be here in Jamaica. And, you know, amongst those persons, there were, you know, individuals that had various practices that they did, and I, and I was introduced to, um, to what was Buddhist chanting, which yes. is the sharing the shonen um nam yo ho renge kyo and it came at a time in my life and i think this is what happens you know yes. when you're needing certain things when you're open to and you surrender to you know what i call divine the divine source mm -hmm. what you need comes to you at the time but you have to be open and receptive to it so i found that by you eating even more healthily and yes. being more attuned to things when that came into my life it centered me it yes. was a way of cutting out, you know, the chatter and the clutter of what was going on in my life at that time. So so I found that was one thing that, that supported my well-being. Yes. Um, along the lines, I've been blessed to um, have been introduced to Transcendental Meditation. Now, that came about in an interesting way. In, you know, in my career, you mentioned earlier risk management and insurance, but at, at some point in my life here in Jamaica, I also find myself sitting in a principal's chair and a director's chair head of a school yeah um and i thought so my passion for children and, and um the development of children and during that journey i said you know something this school has to be different it can't just be like your standard regular school so i reached out to the david lynch foundation in the states who run an amazing um transcendental, transcendental meditation program at schools around the world and what, you, what I was noticing is that children who went through this process, it calmed them right the way down. Their grades went through the roof, their sense of self. So these are children with you know, various issues, behavioral problems. Um, so I, I contacted them and said, you know, can you bring this to my school? And they did. Wow. Um, and that was innovation right there. You were first time, edge. First time in Jamaica, Beautiful. first school to have a program where the children in the morning, first thing in the morning, they had a 20 minute quiet time. I call it quiet time because, you know, obviously there are differing groups in Jamaica who 
you know, might have seen that as something that is alien to them and not as, as open to it. Right. So what we said is that children whose parents didn't want them to be meditating, so to speak, they could sit quietly and pray. But what the parents found overall is that the children themselves, their, that the school, the vibe in the school changed. The levels of disruption and quarrels and, and, and amongst the students yes. calmed right the way down. So I saw the tangible evidence of, of it. So I, it was during that process that I too, the chairman of the board, teachers were introduced to transcendental meditation, the parents that wanted to also had the option and of course myself. Wow. Um, and I found it a valuable tool, a valuable tool for just getting you to that place of quiet and sensitiveness. So my auntie used to say, so your ears can yam grass. Wow. Take notes. Note. <laughs> Take notes. Yes. <laughs> And this is it, a lot of time in life when you're going through so many things that that chatter, the monkey mind, um, causes you not to be able to think of the solutions or to have the solutions come to you that you need. So th that is just one modality, you know, because I'm not of any one particular grouping or faction, religious or otherwise. You know, I, I'm, I'm, to my mind, once somebody somebody's talking peace and love and joy and positivity. That's your religion. That is it. I wake up every morning and love is my, my default. Yes. That's that's the way I like to live my life. And and it, it's brought me a lot of beautiful friendships and connections, in, you know, over the years here in Jamaica. Um, and it's allowed me to really harness what I would consider my divine gifts, the gifts that have been imbued, you know, on me yes. that allow me then to reach out and help others. Right. Yeah. So now we can segue into how you ended up moving from, let us say, um, insurance, risk management, mm -hmm. and from being the head of a school and principal, mm -hmm. to now moving into being part of the healing world where you're utilizing mm -hmm. healing modalities that are related to your gifts, your training, your background, your interests, and your experience because you have basically lived a particular life, lived a particular way, saw the benefits, yes. and now you're combining all of these experiences into modalities that are serving you're passionate because you're passionate about children. Yeah. You're passionate about how children learn. Definitely. You're passionate about how you help children to navigate yeah. their traumas right. and how to integrate these traumas through the modalities of drama. Yes, so indeed. tell us a little bit about that because you're an award-winning actress. Tell us a little bit about that because that's when I met you in Montego Bay. <laughs> yeah, well, I've had the corporate career for all of those years. That was right. my, my primary profession is that of, of currently I'm a risk management consultant, mm -hmm. but I'm kind of retiring out of that mm -hmm. so that I'm, you know, can fully submerge myself into what I'm passionate about doing. Right. Um, so I started in community theatre mm -hmm. in my hometown in the UK, and that would involve young people in the community using drama and plays as a means of transforming their ways of thinking and seeing themselves. A lot of it was around the issue of racism as well and, and, and black people and how they are, you know, as youngsters, they were lashing out mm -hmm. against a system that they felt was treating them unfairly. So drama is a way that you can utilize, you know, that space mm -hmm. to have them sort of come out of their it, grief yes. and their feelings, their emotions, and, and channel it through a play or a process or an exercise or even drama games. Mm -hmm. And in that forum, they can forget for a while. They can suspend the, just the stresses and the strain in enough time to, to feel a little semblance of hope. Right. And that's, that's something that right now in these times, I'm very mindful of the fact that a lot of our youngsters, they've lost hope. They, they're not seeing a future because you know, we as the adults have traumatized them. So, so when I do workshops with, with youngsters and you know, they say things like, oh boy, I don't know Miss, if, if there's going to be anything to look forward to for the future because global warming or this or that, it, it, it tugs at my heartstrings. So I feel like I have a, it's almost like a personal mandate, a personal man, you know, um, mission to, to instill that 
vibe in children again. Let children be children through drama, role playing, having them play, uh, having them to address the, their self esteem, their self confidence issues. And so much can be done through drama, psychodrama, which is something I also um, practice, um, so that you can tap into and, and sort of undo the valves that are building up those tensions in the youngsters. And invariably, the teachers or the parents are getting the, the tail end of it. Right. And all they think is, pitney bad, are they pitney can't be or something is wrong with the child. There's nothing wrong with the children, except that they've not found a means to vent and to express who they are. So the, the joy is when you have a child who come into a classroom or into a drama space and a teacher will say, oh, we have to watch that one because they're there. And I'll say, don't tell me anything about that child because that has been something that's been put on them as a label right. from, from wherever. We're, and they're now wearing that label. They're acting out what we've been telling them they are. And then just have that child because I'm a stranger to them. And then they feel energy is a serious thing. The children feel the fact that I'm not there as another adult that's going to judge them, judge them yeah. criticize them. I and it works with adults as well. So when I do sessions with adults, you know, any psychodrama sessions, you know, it doesn't matter what age, in the corporate boardroom, it can be in a children's home, it doesn't matter where, the same thing pertains. Once a person feels that they're not being judged and that you're not standing there as, okay, you are a problem person and I'm here to fix you. Once you come at them and you, you see them and they see you and that energetic exchange happens, you literally feel, sense them just relaxing. So then that's the point that anything is possible. And you can have a child who's so-called problem child and you know how to say, all right, all right, John, okay, um, you're tapping your finger on that, on that. Build a rhythm with that now. And we're going to bring in something. You can use role play drama and go through that spontaneity of the acting process to make John feel like all of a sudden, oh, weird. I'm useful. I'm valuable. I'm adding something to this group dynamic. And once you get them there and you, you, you find the opportunities to kind of praise whatever they're doing, validation. So That's essentially, true. you combine your passions. Mm -hmm your passion for children, yes. your passion for acting, mm -hmm. and your passion for helping people to heal from their traumas, Most definitely. along with the experience that you had. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a somewhat painful experience growing up with racism, and you now basically turn it all around to create a, a modality that assists, you know, marginalized. It, it, it's, it's interesting you said that, you know, in terms of the, the pain of growing up with that in that environment of racism because whilst I wasn't necessarily personally impacted you know in a in a very stressful traumatic way but living amongst in it persons that were you know experiencing that mm -hmm. it, there is a rub off and I, and I think when you're coming from that place of non-self-acceptance because of who you are I was the only black girl in the class mm -hmm. so you're there kind of trying to smile up yourself so that you know and when the movies used to come on the negative you know, um, documentaries and that that they're showing in the various classes yeah. and you see Africa depicted and you think oh gosh no because yeah. you know some of the children are turn around and say ha, 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 that's your people mm -hmm. so that disassociation that you try to do it strips you of your uh, sense of identity or connectivity with your root with who you are you know so so my transition even before coming to the UK so coming to Jamaica from the UK was about that sense of identity going into community theatre, starting to understand about the history of our people and the fact that, what? There were women who looked like me, who were this and that. There were queens, there were Egyptian pharaohs. And I'm like, wait a minute. The same, the same euphoria that the whole world felt when they watched Wakanda. The, hey, they saw the mean? beautiful <laughs> Wakanda-esque <laughs> females. Well, this is it. It's, it's, it's when you accept yourself, and as I said, this goes across the board, because I work with children from all races um, and all classes. The fact is, once you can get an individual to really acknowledge who they are, accept who they are, mm -hmm. uh, and then come from that space, mm -hmm. that's when the sky's the limit. Right. And, and that's the beauty of going into a classroom, as I said before, that, that's where my heart is. Yeah. And you see a child there, and you see that they're very kind of, you know, introverted and not their self-esteem is on the floor. Yes. And by the time you come out of there, they're coming up to you, Miss, Miss, I, I, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. You, they flourish, they flower. Wow. And that, that's that, kind of that every day of my life.
Yeah. I know that you had also, in addition to doing psychodrama with children yes. and with corporate settings, yes. you also had done a little stint in terms of neural net training. Mm, getting a nice sprinkling here. Yes. I'm going to dove my... Right, so I know that you had done a little bit of neural net training. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because mm -hmm. I'm very much into the left brain, right brain. Yes. Guys, how are we going to do In this? the elements. What do you think we should do? Go with the flow with the rain dropping on my head top. Can you see it dropping on my head top? Mm -hmm. So, Makeda, it, we are getting a little bit of a downpour. Yes, the blessings <laughs> are falling upon us indeed. And so we're going to cut it now and we're going to go do part two where you're going to tell us about your stint with Neuronet and how that yes. is working with how you approach. Um, your work with, with um, young people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm.